From the patient files of Dr. William Wickman, director of Hillbrook Insane Asylum. Patient number 649, Samuel Santini, aka Flatface. Session 14. This was my monthly session with 649. The patient is currently serving time in solitary confinement for murdering another patient. And as per regulations, his sessions are thus kept on a monthly basis as opposed to weekly. <coughs> patient suffers from paranoid delusions, extreme anger issues, and violent outbursts. White male, age 42, black hair, brown eyes, 6.2 feet tall, 220 pounds. Session 14 was held an hour ago, and this is my recording of it. Due to the patient's very violent behavior, he was, as per regulations, kept heavily constrained. Past methods of constrainment have proved ineffective, forcing us to come up with new methods. A special chair has been constructed specifically for use with patient 649. A metal chair, very heavy, impossible to lift, fitted with unbreakable metal neck and ankle straps. As per regulations, 649, wearing a stretch jacket, had been seated in this chair and wheeled into the session room by orderlies prior to my arrival. His neck and ankles were firmly locked in place, enabling him to get out of the chair. Chair has been successfully tested to hold. Before entering the room, I observed 649 for a moment through the two-way mirror. The patient was straining against his constraints. No doubt they're uncomfortable, but what other choice do we have? The patient struggled to turn his neck and look at the mirror. Having spent many times in police interrogation rooms, he no doubt knew someone was standing behind it observing him. His eyes, bloodshot and white, were filled with anger. His forehead was severely bruised, a result of repeatedly slamming his head into the walls of his cell. A transfer to a padded cell may be required. Patient 649 earned his nickname, Flatface, from the shape of his face. It is very, well, flat. This is especially noticeable in profile. Examinations have concluded that 649's nose is so broken there is barely any nose bone left to speak of. This condition of his face plays a major role in the patient's psychosis. The patient's paranoid delusions concern a belief that everyone around him is staring at his oddly shaped face and laughing at it. The patient will respond with physical violence when believing this to be happening, and especially so when someone has looked at him directly, even if only for a couple of seconds and without actually laughing. The patient has, in these cases, imagined mocking laughter and cruel smirks. So far, it is unknown how the patient acquired his facial injuries. I naturally asked him about it directly during our first session together. But this only provoked the patient into violent outbursts. Asking the patient about his physical deformity or hinting at it in any way will, after all, imply that there is something wrong with his face. Saying there is something wrong with his face will be interpreted by the patient as mocking him. In other words, one cannot bring up the subject of his facial deformity in any way. This of course makes it near impossible to treat him. After observing 649 through the glass for a few minutes, I entered the room. The patient immediately turned to stare at me. I did not look at him. I averted my gaze entirely, looking down at the floor. I had no guards with me, but two were posted right outside the door. We are very confident in the chair holding the patient in place. Plus, I had no intentions of setting him off anyway. 649 was placed in his chair in the middle of the room next to a table. 
On the other end of said table was an empty chair. I sat down at this chair. The patient was still staring at me. I could see it out of the corner of my eye. He was making sure I wasn't looking at him. He wouldn't tear his gaze away from me. For the duration of the session, I knew that. If I as much as cast a quick glimpse his way, he'd notice. And whether he'd interpret that as something or nothing, that was uncertain. I therefore turned my attention to my files and notes. Placing them on the table and flipping through them, I asked 649 how he was doing. He was doing fine, he said, staring at me like his eyes were going to pop out of their sockets. Fine, except for the fact everyone was staring at him. I asked, who was staring at him? He just said, everyone. In the past, I've asked him why he thinks people stare at him, but he interpreted that as me making fun of him and thus got angry. I did not make the same mistake again and simply moved on. I flipped over to his criminal record and eyed it. It was filled with offenses, minor and major, spanning almost three decades. 649 was currently serving time for murder and armed robbery, but had been convicted numerous times in the past for other crimes. Uh, these include more murder and armed robbery, carjacking, assault, rape, drug trafficking, and more. 649 was a hardened career criminal, no doubt about it. He would be in prison even without his psychosis. Or would he? That is of course the big mystery with 649. It's the chicken and the egg situation. What came first? 649's criminal behavior or his psychosis? Did his psychosis drive him to crime? His earliest mugshot, taken in 1991, when he was 14, reveals he already had a facial deformity back then. No family photos have been uncovered so far, so by all intents and purposes this is the first photograph of the patient. There are no medical records to be found either. Knowing when the incident that resulted in his injury thus happened is impossible. And as already stated, the injury is a driving force behind the patient's psychosis. Tell me about your childhood, I then asked him. What was it like? It was shit, he answered. Care to elaborate? I asked. He didn't answer. I eyed his case history again. The patient never knew his father. He was raised by a single mother, Gloria Santini. Did your mother treat you badly? I asked. He seemed offended by the question and barked back that his mother was a saint and the most wonderful person in the world. God rest her soul. It was his neighborhood that was shit. The neighborhood they lived in, he said. Still, he made it out okay, he continued. Most people didn't make it out at all. I could imagine it was all in his case file. He grew up in a poor, crime-ridden part of the city. Gangs, drugs, and prostitution everywhere. His first offense at the age of 14 was burglary, committed as part of a local street gang. A few years later he joined a local mob outfit led by a... a... Leonard Tracy, better known as Lazy Eye Tracy. 649 quickly became his top enforcer, murdering countless criminal rivals on his behalf. At the age of 25, 649 killed Lazy Eye Tracy himself and took command of his crew. With 649 as leader, the gang left their drug trade behind and became guns for hire, 
committing robberies and murders on behalf of various other, bigger crime lords. It's all there in the files. Every crime, every testimony, and every conviction. But it doesn't tell me anything. So, trying to bait him, I asked, Is there any moment in your childhood that stands out? Something that happened. Something that was especially bad. A violent altercation, perhaps. He just laughed. Every day was a violent altercation, Doc, he said. He was still staring at me to see if I ever looked at him. He hadn't taken his gaze off of me for even a second. Still, a violent altercation isn't really enough to explain his psychosis. I suspect some form of public humiliation may have played a hand in it. Public humiliation at a very young age, probably related to his facial injury, which led to trauma that only grew worse as the patient participated in violent crimes on a regular basis. Alright, I tried. How about a good memory? Care to tell me about something nice that happened in your childhood? A moment when you were happy. When was the last time you were happy, Sam? I asked. He just murmured something unintelligible and tried shaking his head. Come on, Sam, I started. You spend most of your time in solitary. This is a rare chance to talk to someone, have a conversation. Don't you want that? You can tell me anything, anything you'd like. I was being honest, too. I wanted him to tell me anything, give me something that I could work with. I was so tired of our sessions always hitting a brick wall. Happy, he then said, repeating the word a few times, like trying to figure out what it meant. Then a faint smile formed on his face. I could see it out of the corner of my eye. I was almost shocked. My mother used to sing to me, he said. Sing to me when I was a kid. I sat there in awe, not believing what I was hearing. She used to sing to me this tune, and he hummed the tune for a few seconds. The lyrics, he said, went that he was the most handsome boy in the world. The most handsome boy in the whole wide world. His mother used to sing it every night before going to bed. Well, that was certainly interesting. I wrote it down in my notebook. Then I said to him, Sam, there really isn't anything wrong with the way you look. And that was a very bad move. Noble, but stupid. I don't know what I was thinking. I must have forgotten who I was dealing with. Patient 649 naturally made the assumption that I was making fun of him. To put it mildly, he got a bit upset. And I sure was glad we put him in that chair. Let's just say, if it wasn't for that chair, you wouldn't be hearing this recording. We were unfortunately forced to cut it short there. Session 14 with patient 649 ended the same way they all do. I've got hopes for a session 15 coming up in a month though. Because regardless of my clumsiness there at the end, I did learn something new. Something positive. I choose to remain optimistic. End recording.